many, many years ago when I was a student at IU, the residence hall where I lived would periodically invite professors to come for evening chats. Um, these were very informal discussions that took place in the main lounge and generally attended by maybe eight, 10, 12 students. I attended a number of these, but only retained anything of substance from one. The guest professor was from the College of Arts and Sciences, and his special area of interest was world religions. The discussion was wide ranging, but he offered two analogies that have stuck with me over the years. Uh, and I would characterize one of these as sort of a big picture analogy, and, and the other is more of a small picture analogy. In the first one, he compared the idea of religion to climbing a mountain. At the very peak of the mountain, the goal, if you will, was the achievement of a total understanding of God or multiple gods or the attainment of absolute spiritual fulfillment or whatever goal your religious tradition or your individual belief system would be deemed worthy of being at the peak of the mountain. The path toward the peak is different for different religious traditions and for different individuals. Some people opt not even to make the effort. Those that do may venture forward in groups or may do so alone. They may do so with or without a guide. Some may take the easiest path, whereas others might take the most challenging. Some move ahead relentlessly on the path leading most directly to the top. Others may need to regroup before seeking an alternate route. What I took away from the analogy is that even though religious practices may differ greatly, the ultimate goals are, in many ways, very similar. The small picture analogy focused on how individuals move toward the top. There's no magic carpet, no high-speed elevator, no Star Trek-like transporter. It is, as in our evening walks, step by step by step, often deliberate and usually slow. A group or a guide may establish the path, but we take the steps. The process may even be characterized as mundane, but it is not unimportant. Come, let us worship together as we continue to move forward step by step by step. Got it. Great. What's inside? Yes. What is it? A ladybug. A ladybug. I wonder if there's a ladybug in my story. Maybe I can come up with a story that has a ladybug in it. For now, I'll put it there. You want to have a seat? Kids, I wonder if anyone, maybe a teacher, grandparent, adult, parent, has ever told you to hurry up. Yeah. Adults, have has someone told you to hurry up? Yes. Yeah, this is a shared thing we have all had happen to us. Hurry up. So this is a story about slowing down in a hectic world and being mindful. It is Tisha and the Blossoms by Wendy Madour. Tisha was catching blossoms in her backyard. Hurry up, cried mom. You'll be late for school. On the way, Tisha stopped to listen to sounds. Hurry up, I'm running late, said the bus driver. In the classroom, Tisha found a book about space. Hurry up. We're going to be late for the assembly, cried the teacher. On the playground, Tisha found a ladybug. One, two, 
three, four. Hurry up, you're going to miss pudding, called her friend. Oh, have you ever had a day like that? It seems like everybody's telling you to hurry up and being pulled and pushed in all those directions. Yeah. After lunch, Tisha drew a space shuttle. It had three windows, two wheels, one bright red. Hurry up, said the teacher. It's time to put your crayons away. When it was time to go home, Tisha's mom showed up and gave her a kiss and picked up her backpack. And she said, we better hurry so we don't miss the bus. No, thank you, said Tisha. What's the matter? asked her mom. I've done too much hurrying up today. Can we please have a little slow down? Her mom smiled. If your legs aren't too tired, we could walk home. It's just a few blocks. Yes, please, said Tisha. When I was a girl, said Herman, I used to play a game called How Many. I wonder if any of you have ever played this game. Like, how many yellow cars can you see? There's one over there, Tisha pointed. On the walk home, they saw five seagulls, three blue umbrellas, two sausage dogs, you know, like dachshunds. <laughs> and one enormous hat. <laughs> and then they sat on a bench in the sunshine and they gave each of the pigeons names as they sat in the park. Oh, you must get hungry. You must be hungry, said dad. I better hurry up and make dinner. We don't, why don't we just have a picnic? Instead, said mom. Oh, yes, I love picnics. Do any of you love picnics? Yeah, I love a good picnic. We can crunch the cucumbers, chew the cheese, and feel the pickles tingle on our tongues. <laughs> Dad could crunch the loudest, mom could chew the longest, and Tisha felt the most tingles on her tongue. And then a soft wind. Can you make a soft wind with me? A soft wind blew. And the blossoms started to fall. And they laughed and danced and caught the blossoms. And as Tish was settling into bed that night, she said, I think my favorite days are full of blossoms and a bit of slowing down. And that is the story of Tisha and the Blossoms by Wendy Madore. I hope you each find time this week to slow down. And kids, if you'll follow me, we're going to go to the room and then go outside to make some music with my friend Chris. We have three readings this morning. The first is from Buddhism Without Beliefs, A Contemporary Guide to Awakening by Stephen Batchelor. I am confused. This confusion is not a state of darkness in which I fail to see anything. It is partial blindness rather than sightlessness. By not seeing well, I misconstrue things. The world is so saturated with the meanings given to it that those meanings seem to reside in the things themselves. We habitually assume the world presented through the senses to exist out there just as it appears. As you listen to sounds and observe sensations in the body, consider how what you experience is configured by your own conditioning, habits, and views. The second reading is 
from the little book on meaning, why we crave it and how, how we create it by Laura Berman Fortgang. What makes a meaningful relationship with another person? What constitutes meaningful work? Is it what is said or done or rather how it makes us feel? I'd answer that meaning is something we feel more than something we do. Meaning is a state of consciousness. It comes tumbling forth from connection to ourselves, each other, the earth, spirit, work, or even an inanimate object. Meaning is where you look for it and also how you look for it. The third reading is from Undivided Mind, Becoming Whole by Rodney Smith. A lay Buddhist is one who fully embodies his or her entire life of work, family, and relationships without spiritually prioritizing any activity. From this perspective, all moments are equally precious. And whether we are practicing formal meditation on retreat or showing up for ordinary moments of our lay life, freedom is never diminished. The unequivocal resolve not to move away from where we are is essential. Once we abandon the belief that there is more spirit spiritually useful moment than the one we, were, we are in, we have embraced our life and infused it with the energy for awakening. We often feel our everyday existence is a distraction from our spiritual intention. When this happens, life is divided between the sacred and mundane, and the mind pits one concept against the other. But belief shapes reality, and if the belief is maintained that the sacred lies somewhere else other than now, our spiritual life will be governed by that limitation. All divisions are attempts to keep us from the truth of what is right here. Suddenly, the Buddha is found in the middle of relationships, work, and family, within all activities, reactions, thoughts, and emotional responses. Nothing is outside now because no boundary is drawn to separate now from then. The message of the Buddha is equally relevant in all locations and at all times. When we invest the sacred into specific conditions, we feel spiritual only when we ha are having those experiences. The rest of life goes spiritually unnoticed. Spiritual forms and rituals can be very helpful in focusing our intention and providing a doorway to the sacred, sacredness of all life. They can awaken a sensitivity of heart and allow our mind to become quiet. Forms and rituals become a problem when they stop representing a gateway into oneself and become an exclusive presentation of the sacred, such as the belief that the only way to commune with God is by going to church or taking a walk in nature, or that the only way to meditate is to be alone in quiet surroundings. Well, good morning. It is uh, truly a, a joy to be here. Um, the <clears throat> incident that, excuse me, gave rise to this sermon happened uh, several years ago, but it, uh, it's still relevant. It comes from the time when a significant part of my ministry included hospital chaplaincy at Ball Hospital. Here's the story, at least as I remember it. I was on call for the weekend. Our on-call weekends ran from 4 o'clock on Friday afternoon through 8 o'clock 
Monday morning. Unlike some hospitals, we did not have to be on site as long as we were close enough that our response time was, was reasonable. So when I was on call, I went about doing whatever, whatever else I needed to do as long as I stuck around close. But I was always prepared to be interrupted at any moment and need to change gears very quickly. Well, if I recall the sequence of events rightly, I'd been called in to participate in a case conference. Finished, I finished up at the hospital and then arrived to church. It was Sunday by that time in the weekend, and I arrived to church time for at least the last part of the service. Afterwards, I went home, ate lunch, and set about cleaning up the backyard. My husband and I have always had dogs, at least one, and I'm the one who cleans up after them. He mows, shovels snow. I clean up the yard. It works. Um, in the middle of poop scooping, my pager went off. Okay, that's how long ago this was. We still had pagers. Um, and uh, the beep happened. Uh, so I was again called in, this time to be with the family in the emergency department. And with that completed, I went home and finished cleaning up the yard. Well, this scenario led me to muddling on what's meaningful and what isn't. And for the next several minutes, I'd like us to reflect together on the following propositions suggested by our three readings this morning. As Stephen Batchelor suggests, meaning is something that we attribute to events and things, not an inherent property of them. Meaning also comes from connection, as Fort Game suggests. And she also notes that meaning comes from being present, being engaged, staying in the present, um, showing up, staying with it. Rodney Smith notes that our daily lives and all of their ordinariness, all their mundaneness, are where the stuff of meaning is to be found, if it's to be found anywhere. And then that leads into the conclusion that our entire lives are sacred. Okay, so let's go back to Bachelor's book, Buddhism Without Beliefs, um, from whence I have drawn our first insight. Bachelor writes about being confused. In his confusion, he says, the meaning that things have seems to inhere in the things themselves. Now, don't we all get confused in this way? How many times do we attribute the meaning of something to the thing in itself, to the object? Ministry is meaningful. Cleaning up after the dog, not so much. Dinner with our families, meaningful. Quick hamburger grabbed at a fast food place, yeah, not so meaningful. A good conversation with a friend, meaningful. Folding laundry, okay, you get the idea. Pause for a moment and think about how you divide your life into meaningful and not meaningful categories. Well, once we've stashed something into the not meaningful category, what happens? Well, here's what happens, at least for me. I tend to pay less attention to it. I approach it on autopilot, and my primary goal is to complete whatever task it is as quickly as possible, and preferably while thinking about something else. If it's a seriously unpleasant task, I may even wish I were doing something else or being somewhere else. Whatever the experience is, at that point, it has definitely landed in that stack of things that do not contribute helpfully to my life. Now, what's interesting here is this all happens without my conscious intention. It's not like I'm intending to do this. Um, it's simply part of the filter 
for which I experience, through which I experience my life. Let's look at the example again. <clears throat> Can I find meaning in cleaning up after our dog? Well, for one thing, it's nice weather. And it's just good to be outdoors if it's nice weather, no matter what I'm doing. And further, the same dog that I need to clean up after brings us a great deal of joy. Cleaning up the backyard is also one of the things that, one of the contributions that I do that contributes to the overall pleasantness of, of our home. It gives me a chance to walk the backyard slowly, paying attention, so I know what's going on with our grass and our plants. It hasn't been too long since I noticed a cicada in the spruce tree, its wings glistening in the sun. I check out the roof of the house and the awnings to make sure nothing is amiss. I hear the calls of birds if I'm paying attention. Notice the deck and the plants on it, which I'm particularly pleased this year. So it, uh, but, but to see that, to, to have that experience, I have to be paying attention. Well, Bachelor proposes an alternative to attributing the meaning of something to the thing in itself. Meaning isn't inherent. It's something that we give to or withhold from events. Well, be aware, he counsels, of how much our experiences are defined by what we've labeled as meaningful or not. It is we ourselves who paint a veneer of meaning or meaninglessness over our experiences. And because we're the ones who do that, we're the ones who paint that layer over our experiences, we can change what we've painted. When we do, we're more likely to discover the meaning in the everyday. <clears throat> Interfaith minister Laura Berman Fortgang links meaning and connection in her book, the little book on meaning. She writes, meaning comes tumbling forth from connection. I love her metaphor. Well, if she's right about this, the way we disconnect from those experiences that we have labeled as not meaningful virtually guarantees that they will remain devoid of any meaning. Therein lies part of the solution. Stay connected. When we do that, we can find meaning in and through very, very ordinary things. It's a matter of attitude. Be fully present for it all. Observe. Connect. Just seeing what's going on, really seeing it, is the point. Showing up, being present. Um, and many, many, many years ago, Ram Das, I'm going to date myself here. Ram Das wrote a book entitled Be Here Now. And uh, that's the point. Simply be here now. And when we do that, we'll find the meaning that we seek and we want. It shows up in unexpected places, transforming us and our experiences. If meaning is a state of consciousness, as Fort Gang says, then it's a state of our, of our consciousness. It doesn't reside in the thing itself or in the activity. Whether a routine grocery shopping trip is meaningful or not, depends on how we approach it. Meaning happens, for me at any rate, as I am consciously aware of connections. Very early on in the pandemic, my husband and I began picking up our weekly grocery order curbside rather than shopping in the store. And yeah, it does have its advantages for sure. <laughs> um, but I soon found out that I missed the friendly eye contact and brief chat with a couple of the cashiers whose aisles we frequently went through. Um, 
it was that was part of the part of the rhythm of of my life and uh, i discovered that was i was missing that i soon found out uh, i've learned to both look for the times that meaning occurs unexpectedly and to look at every experience as a potential source of meaning two things are different but they're related and the one reinforces the other we experience meaning in connectedness in the rib ribbons of relationship that bind us together with the entire interdependent web of being At the time of its earliest beginnings, most of you probably know this, at the time of its earliest beginnings, Buddhism was practiced exclusively in monastic communities where women and men, and later only men, there actually were women in those communities at the very beginning, um, starting with uh, the Buddha's mother. Um, but later it was, it was restricted to men. Mm. Uh, and those people in those communities then invited, devoted their entire lives to the practice of religion and the quest for enlightenment. It was a very, very single-minded, uh, arduous uh, quest in the beginning. And true householder Buddhist practice did not develop until much, much later. It has flourished, however, as Buddhism has grown and adapted to how we practice religion in the United States, most U.S. Buddhists have absolutely no desire to become nuns or monks. And even if they did, there aren't very many of that traditional type of monasteries in this country. There are some. But nonetheless, U.S. Buddhists want to reap the benefits of Buddhist practice. Rather than leading us away from involvement in the world and into some kind of cloistered monastic setting, engaged Buddhism directs us right into the middle of this world. Everyday life is the ground of our practice. Everyday life is where we will find meaning. We find it at all. We need not and should not can find meaning to special moments. All moments, as Smith says, are equally valuable, equally precious. He writes, as you heard in the reading, once we abandon the belief that there is a more spiritually useful moment than the one we are in, we have embraced our life and infused it with the energy for awakening. And I would add, we have infused it with the transforming energy of meaning. Our everyday life isn't a distraction from what's important, but it is what's important. There is simply no more meaningful moment than right now. Enlightenment, meaning, connection are all right here, right now, in this place and in this time, no matter what that is. To divide our lives into meaningful and not so meaningful moments keeps us from experiencing life's meaning in its wholeness. And it maintains the divisions in our, our minds and our hearts that limit the meaning that we experience. Again, our everyday life isn't a distraction, but it's the stuff, it's the raw material from which meaning is made. We are called into a life undivided. So, can we bring the same quality of intentional presence, of being right there in the moment, to the most mundane tasks as well as to those moments we consider meaningful. Can we stop dividing our lives into what's meaningful and what isn't? And instead, can we find the meaning in all of it? It's an important question because the truth of the matter is that most of our lives, most of the time, 
are composed of very ordinary moments. If you think about it. Sometimes we might even experience some of them as downright subordinary moments, if there is any such word. Uh, moments that even fall below that threshold of ordinary. Peak experiences, those glistening, gleaming moments that are engraved on our hearts forever, are few and far between. And what of our lives in the meantime? If we're living for life's wondrous moments, what do we do with life's ordinary moments? Switch, switch languages a little bit here. Some time ago, it's been a long time ago now, um, my husband Tom and I spent some time in Kusnach, Switzerland, where Swiss psychiatrist Carl Jung lived a large part of his adult life and did a lot of his writing. Jung's writing has been a, a very, very important influence on my self-understanding, how I experience religion, why I think it's important, um, as well as on my professional work and professional understanding of, of religion. And so being able to go to Kusnacht and see where, where Jung had lived and something of a pilgrimage for me. It's definitely one of those peak experiences. Well, on the lintel above the entrance door to his home in Kusnacht, Jung had carved a message that in translation reads, called or not, called or not, the God will be present. Jung's statement makes essentially the same point in different language. We don't have to be somewhere special or to be doing something special in order to find the holy. Our entire lives, in all their ordinariness, in all their dailiness, in all their humanity, in all their splendor, our whole lives are holy, however we, however we interpret that word. And I know it's a word subject to a lot of different interpretations, but however we interpret it, there's no division. The meaningful suffuses the mundane, just waiting for us to see it. It's all holy. It's all meaningful. This, by the way, is a is a an extension kind of to its furthest logical reach, I think, of um, our of what our Unitarian and Universalist forebears um, who came out of the obviously out of the Protestant Christian tradition uh, that erased the separation between the sacred and the profane. It's a standard uh, standard Protestant point. And uh, this extends that to its, pretty much to its logical conclusion, I think. To sum up then, as we stay present and engaged with all the moments of our lives, we're aware of the connections that anchor us in the interdependent web of being. We find meaning in our daily lives, in all their ordinariness, their mundaneness, their grandeur, their magnificence. There are no divisions. We do not have to be different. We don't have to go anywhere else. We don't have to do anything differently. Right here, right now, wherever and whenever that is, it is enough.